Buenas tardes a todos. Bueno, espero que esto funcione bien, me alejo un poco. Eh, ante todo, quisiera agradecer la gentileza del de profesor Ajayán por haber aceptado esta invitación a dar esta conferencia aquí en Madrid. Por supuesto, quisiera agradecer a la Fundación Ramón Areces todo el trabajo que ha realizado organizando también esta charla. Es un placer, como siempre. Manuel, muchísimas gracias por todo el trabajo como siempre, muy bien hecho. Eh, hoy tenemos eh, una conferencia de una persona que destaca tanto por su calidad científica, como vamos a ver a continuación, que voy a dar algunos números, tampoco me quiero alargar en ese sentido, como por su calidad humana. Yo conocí en Colombia al profesor Ajayán porque nos invitaron a dar una conferencia. Yo no sabía quién era el otro ponente, y cuando me enteré de quién era el otro ponente, la verdad es que uno siente cierto, cierta presión ¿no? cuando tiene al lado una persona con una calidad científica como es la de Ajayán, sobre todo cuando no se le conoce. Uno tiende a pensar que esta gente con estos currículum, pues a lo mejor puede ser gente un poco eh, difícil en absoluto. ¿eh? Me di cuenta perfectamente que, aparte de ser un gran científico, era una persona que se interesaba por toda la ciencia que hacía el resto de personas que estaban allí, sobre todo el resto incluso de estudiantes que se acercaban. Esto eh, indica que es una persona que realmente se interesa por las personas y por lo que son capaces de hacer y no solamente se miran al ombligo su propio trabajo. Eh, él es ingeniero metalúrgico, eh, eh, inició sus estudios en Banaras Hindu University, en India, Luego hizo una tesis doctoral ya en Northwestern, en, en, en Estados Unidos, ya sobre Material Science and Engineering. Eh, luego, bueno, ha hecho muchísimas estancias largas a lo largo de su vida, pero solo por nombrar alguna estuvo en Tsukuba, en Japón, trabajando con NEC Corporation, en Fundamental Research Laboratory, NEC Corporation. También estuvo en Orsay, en Francia, en el Laboratorio de Física de Sólidos de la Universidad de París Sud. En la Max Plan, eh, evidentemente, estuvo bastante tiempo en Stuttgart. En Francia ha estado en Estrasburgo, en la Universidad de Louis Pasteur. Es un hombre que ha ido, eh, yo diría, dejando casi grupos y dejando su conocimiento disperso por, por muchos lugares del mundo. Eh, donde realmente inició su, digamos, su trabajo ya como profesor fue en, en el Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Material eh, Science and Engineering Department, ¿no? en, en, en Troy, en New York, ¿no? donde estuvo pues, eh, bastantes años ya trabajando, primero como asistente asociado, lo típico, ¿no? hasta que llegas a profesor y ya tienes eh, responsabilidades. Ha pasado también bastante tiempo en Tsinghua University, en China, y eh, luego también en Alemania, en, en Karlsruhe, en el en Instituto de Nanotecnología. Es eh, profesor distinguido en cantidad de, 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 de universidades en todo el mundo, en Japón, en China, en India, en Singapur, en, tal, y, y luego al final ha recalado desde el año 2007 hasta la actualidad en, en el Rice University, en es el director del Departamento de Material Science and Nano Engineering Department, que combina con estancias por todo el mundo en, en, en todos estos sitios que he comentado. Solo, vamos a ver, el listado de premios internacionales ocupa un folio por las dos caras, no voy a, evidentemente no voy a leer ninguno, solo quiero decir que es una persona eh, muy reconocida, ha escrito tres libros, de los cuales hay uno, bueno, pues yo diría que es un, uno de los libros más leídos en el campo de Nanocomposite Science and Technology, que es de, de Willey Publishers y que es una, una maravilla. Eh, tiene más de 1.200 publicaciones en revistas científicas con mucho impacto. Solo hay que ver que tiene un, un, un índice H, que tanto hablamos de 198, ¿eh? y tiene más de 180.000 citas. Entonces, hablaba con el profesor Aguilar antes que, bueno, me decía... Hombre, eh, no damos mucha importancia a esos números, pero cuando alguien tiene esos números realmente tiene que ser algo excepcional, ¿no? que es, es su caso. Ha dirigido 55 tesis eh, doctorales, más de 400, 401 con la de hoy, eh, conferencias invitadas 
y tiene más de 30 patentes, muchas de ellas están en explotación, lo que demuestra que es un hombre que también se preocupa realmente por eh, la valorización de su investigación. Yo no voy a, a decir nada más de él porque creo que va a, a quedar todo dicho con la exposición que va a hacer, que es una visión global sobre la nanoingeniería. La nanoingeniería pretende eh, utilizar los nanomateriales que son eh, aquellos materiales que están compuestos por unidades lo suficientemente pequeñas como para que haya una serie de efectos, efectos cuánticos, que hacen que tengan un comportamiento eh, inesperado, eh, pero ahora ya conocido, porque hay mucha gente que se dedica básicamente a estudiar la física que está detrás precisamente de la interacción entre superficies y volúmenes, que hace que aparezcan esta serie de, de de propiedades especiales en, en los materiales. Sé que hoy estoy hablando ante gente que no está en el mundo de la ciencia, por eso me permito pues, explicarlo así. O sea, se consiguen eh, propiedades inesperadas y la nanoingeniería lo que hace es utilizar precisamente esos materiales con propiedades especiales para hacer dispositivos que son los que generan tecnologías que, sin lugar a duda, están cambiando nuestras vidas, solo que no lo sabemos muchas veces lo que hay detrás. Profesor Ajayán. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Oh, I see, okay. In any case. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> I'm not going to say that I understood everything that Ramon said, uh, but I can kind of pick up a few things, and uh, especially what he said about Colombia. And uh, you know, we were there together, and sometimes you make friends in the strangest of places. Um, but uh, it's nice that I met you there. Uh, thank you for th thank you for the foundation for hosting me, <coughs> and thanks Ramon for organizing this. Uh, I see that uh, it's such a beautiful place, uh, and it's an honor to be here to give this talk. <coughs> um, and again, I'm imagining that the audience is kind of broad, and uh, um, so I kept it rather broad, uh, this talk, so that you will at least appreciate some of the things that's been done in nanomaterials and nanotechnology. I basically made my career out of nanotechnology uh, since the beginning of my PhD. Uh, until now, I've only worked on very, very small things, and I'll talk about a few uh, of the things that we have done over the years, uh, particularly uh, you know, some specific things about the challenges that uh, the, such a field will face and faces and uh, where we are heading to. Uh, and as Ramon said, I come from Rice University. It's a hundred-year-old institution in the middle of Houston, which is the energy capital. Uh, it used to be the energy capital. I don't know how it's going to evolve with this new alternative energy being the center stage. Uh, but certainly, uh, it has uh, a strong footprint of energy industry and uh, healthcare industry. And uh, uh, it's a pretty large city in the uh, southern part of Texas. So, let me start with a quote from uh, one of my favorite physicists, who is Machio Kaku, who said that, uh, you know, what we are going to witness in the future is that our life is going to be controlled by not exactly gods, but by certain types of science and technologies. And what is interesting about this is that he mentions nanotechnology very prominently in this. And that's very much uh, true because it's also said that those who control materials control technology. And uh, so many times materials form the foundational aspect of many of the emerging technologies. And nanotechnology or nanoengineering forms a significant part of the new materials uh, that's going to be uh, emerging. <clears throat> but there's also, uh, you know, one, one can go back and ask what really is nanotechnology? And uh, unlike many of the other technologies like bio and information, uh, here is a technology essentially named after a length scale, which is also interesting. You know, one would ask, uh, why, why is this nanoscale so interesting and important? Uh, multiple answers to this. Of course, you know, we, we are always driving towards miniaturization, uh, 
Uh, if you take the major technology like electronics, we always push the limits of dimensions because you want to pack more stuff in a smaller space. Uh, and that's where, uh, in fact, the nanotechnology comes into the picture because you really want to make devices that are functional at uh, the smallest scale that is possible. Uh, but there's also many other reasons why nano is in interesting. Even the fundamental of life, which is DNA, is in that range. So there's something to do with uh, how structures or molecules were created uh, in, in a bottom-up fashion, particularly in biological systems and so on. So nano certainly uh, prominently features in many of the building blocks that are fundamental to many things, you know, technologies, but also life. And that's uh, another reason why uh, this technology has become quite fascinating. Uh, and of course, there's another basic science reason, uh, and this is because when structures go to that scale, fundamental properties can have a significant deviation from their bulk behavior. Uh, you know, there are many, many examples of this, uh, even a, a fiber that, when, when it becomes very small, uh, loses its potential to have dislocation, so it loses plasticity. Uh, and that, this is an example. Or, uh, you know, the uh, mean free path of electrons could be larger than the size of this uh, uh, structure, so the electronic properties could be completely different. So there are many reasons why nanoscale is interesting and important. So on the, on the one side, you're really trying to make things at that scale, and on the other side, you're really trying to understand what happens when you cross certain dimensions, and uh, that, of course, is dependent on what property you're looking at. And again, nano comes from a Greek word, and you know, the size is about uh, uh, 10 to the power 9, minus 9 meters, so it's really very, very small scale. So you have the challenges in trying to manipulate these structures, and that'll be the essence of my talk, uh, giving you multiple examples of this. <clears throat> now, actually, before I started to talk, I was asked this question, uh, you know, wh wh what really are the applications of nanomaterials and nanotechnology today? Because it's been around for 20 years, and we haven't really seen some, you know, revolutionary things that we promised. And this, you know, somebody said that uh, uh, this whole area uh, suffers from an excess of imagination. Uh, but that's what uh, happens in uh, academic environments and academic, uh, uh, among academic people, that we have the tendency to think broadly and boldly, and many times the promises that we make are disconnected to the actual requirements uh, for industry. Uh, or it is a question of timeline. You know, many times things take much longer than what we uh, suspect in the beginning. Uh, and it's a combination of many of these things that ultimately has taken you know, quite a long while to see the real impact of nanotechnology. And I'm extremely positive that this will happen uh, 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 you know, to us in many, many different ways. Uh, and uh, again, today's talk is essentially trying to look at this from this perspective and see what might be some of the intrinsic challenges as well as extrinsic challenges in seeing this technology happen in its fullest scale. Now, in, in some sense, this technology has actually happened in a big way. You know, semiconductor industry is a great example. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the way materials are made or created at the nanoscale is quite different from many of the things that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so there is a, a distinct difference between the top-down technologies that uh, industries like semiconductor manufacturing does versus the bottom-up uh, technologies that ultimately nanotechnology would like to uh, happen. Uh, the bottom up, the greatest example is biological systems where things actually assemble and become functional. <laughs> Whereas in many cases, in, in the case of semiconductors, for example, you machine things down and create structures that are small enough. Uh, and of course, there is a limit to how small you can make by the top down technologies. But if you look at that, that uh, uh, the illustration, you can see that they have done an amazing job. And they are pushing the limits of you know, less than 10 nanometers today. Right? Even you know, companies are talking about three nanometer devices that will ultimately become commercial. So uh, you know, it, it's a very, very interesting uh, dichotomy of these two different approaches. One, really machining things down and getting to smaller scales. Uh, and two, assembling from the bottom up the building blocks and then getting things to work. And uh, we are probably uh, in, in this uh, time when both those things are being tried and ultimately there will be some kind of synergy between uh, those two. And there is plenty of examples of amazing nanotechnology in nature. You know, this is 
of, of course, a great example, which I always point out in my classroom, uh, it, it is a beautiful nano composite, and it's essentially made of uh, a chalk, uh, you know, that you use on to write on the uh, on the board, right? It's a, uh, if you think about chalk, it's an extremely brittle material. You can actually break it in your hand, but this material, which is 99% of chalk or calcium carbonate, uh, cannot be broken, uh, you know, unless you really put so much effort. And the reason for that is essentially nano engineering. You know, what this material is all about creating nanoscale plates, platelets of car calcium carbonate sandwiched between very, very thin layers of protein so that uh, as you try to break it, the cracks have to run through huge number of these interfaces and ultimately it you know, takes enormous amount of energy to do that. And hence, this becomes an extremely tough material. So what it shows is that you can take a material that is really as brittle as chalk and build something like this, which is really one of the toughest materials that you can find. So this is the essence of you know, nanoengineering and the bottom-up building or build-up of materials and structures that we ultimately want to aim for. And of course, that is not as simple as it seems, and obviously that's why no one has actually been able to make uh, such a tough material from this uh, bottom-up engineering aspect. Now, as nanotechnology is evolving and as it is merging towards this uh, whole area of quantum materials, the control that you need in these systems becomes extremely important. You know, how well you can control the creation of these materials, how you controllably you can manipulate individual atoms, you know, how controllably you can create defects in these. All these ultimately plays into how successful this is going to be. And there are many aspects of these challenges that I want to kind of quickly highlight. Uh, one of them is actually compatibility, because many times when you are trying to create a nanoscale device and integrate it with a larger structure or a platform, you, you end up with this compatibility issue. Uh, you know, e even if, if I try to make a, a, a simple device from a structure like a carbon nanotube or even molecular electronic, the contact that you make is much larger than the actual device that you are trying to deal with. And that incompatibility creates a lot of challenges, and it's been one of the bottlenecks in trying to get performances from these devices. And similarly, there are things like uh, you know, noise that ultimately enters into the whole uh, uh, you know, detection uh, of some of these uh, um, uh, devices. And that essentially dominates when things become so small, and that's also becoming problematic. Uh, and, and then from a materials point of view, there is also another aspect which is related to the characterization of these materials. You know, how quickly and how reliably you can look at defects, how reliably you can look at the overall structure and then get the feedback into the whole process so that you can ultimately build consistently good materials is, is really a problem. And, uh, you know, most of the time in order to look at such small structures, you have to utilize techniques like electron microscopy or scanning tunneling spectroscopy. And those are very, very tedious techniques. And so th that aspect of it has been really problematic. And in many cases now, we rely on computational aspects, computational science to actually guide us to build certain types of materials. And there's a whole... Uh, area called materials genome, where you can get, get predictive power to actually rely on to build new materials. Uh, and again, synthesis and processing is part of this whole food chain, which ultimately have to be controlled to a, at a single atom precision if you really want to get uh, you know, great materials. So these are some of the overall aspects of nanoengineering that one has to worry about, you know, controlling the specificity of these materials, structure, sh shape, size, those are interesting and important. Scalability, which is really not an intrinsic aspect, but uh, you know, ultimately, if you want to make uh, uh, an array of devices, you need to have large uh, nano manufacturing that is uh, figured out. Then interfaces becomes a major aspect of all these. You know, as I said several times already that uh, when you try to get nanomaterials to work, it has to be interfaced with something else or interfaced with itself. And those interfaces dominate most of the properties. And in fact, if you look at that shell that I showed you, the property of the toughness is completely dominated by the interfaces. Right? So how do you control interfaces to that precision so that you can really build uh, uh, fascinating materials? And then there are other things like integration and assembly.
So I'm going to give you uh, two or three examples, depending on the time I have. Uh, one, of course, is nanoscale carbon materials, which has really dominated the field of nanomaterials for quite a while. Uh, and uh, again, uh, in my own uh, career, I started to work with nanocarbons very early on, and uh, many of the examples that I'll show you is from those work that we have done over the years. <clears throat> and uh, the story of nanocarbons is fascinating. You know, it was, uh, in fact, uh, started at Rice University, uh, because there was a visitor from England who came to Rice to work with uh, uh, Professor Richard Smalley and uh, you know, uh, Robert Curl. His name was Harry Croto, and uh, you probably some of you already know what happened in that collaboration. Essentially, they discovered the fullerene molecules of the C60. And until that time, solid carbons were essentially considered as either graphite or diamond. And maybe there are other types of disordered carbons uh, that was also uh, you know, useful. Uh, but for the first time, uh, when they were looking very specifically at uh, molecular scale carbons using mass spec, they found that there was this huge peak at 60 atom carbon, which means that there was particular structure being stabilized with 60 carbon atoms. And it took really a lot of thinking and ingenuity to really come up with the structure of fullerenes, which is essentially uh, ultimately ended up as a soccer ball structure. Right? So I think that started a revolution in looking at materials at the molecular scale or nanoscale, and resulted in a number of discoveries later on uh, that is related to this uh, kind of uh, structures that you can find at the nanoscale. I won't talk too much about the fullerenes because um, you know I kind of started my career post-dating the discovery of fullerenes, and this. Uh, uh, material that you're seeing in the middle is where I started, the carbon nanotube, and I'll speak a few more things about that. A fascinating uh, material and structure, almost a poster child in the area of nanomaterials for a very long time. And of course, graphene came up later, and uh, uh, of course, I will also mention a few things related to graphene. <coughs> So the carbon nanotube is really a perfect story. Uh, it was found serendipitously in a material that was derived from the carbon arc discharge, and uh, uh, Professor Sumio Ijima at NEC was looking, uh, just uh, as a microscopist, looking at uh, uh, a range of structures that, that was part of this uh, suit that generated from the electric arc. Uh, and he found these beautiful molecules or these fibers that were present within the suit that was uh, surrounding it. Uh, and you can see, you know, it, the, the dimensions are so small. Uh, if you look at that cylinder, that, that tube that you see, the inside of the tube is about two nanometers, and you can go all the way to one nanometer, right? And then there is this cylinder, beautiful cylinder that goes for microns and microns and microns into some, uh, sometimes millimeters. So imagine a structure like this, right? Such a tiny diameter, very large uh, di uh, length, and such a beautifully perfect structure made from this hexagonal honeycomb lattice of graphene or carbon uh, that has been known for us for, uh, for a very, very long time, you know, graphitic structure. So carbon is very special because it hybridizes into sp2 and sp3 hybridization. One forms this layered structure, which is called the sp2 hybridization, forming this hexagonal honeycomb lattice, which is stacked layers of this hexagonal honeycomb lattice. So to think about this tube is to take a layer of this graphite and then fold it into a beautiful cylinder, you know, completely uh, perfect. In fact, you can actually see this in this uh, uh, illustration, uh, a, a honeycomb that has been <laughs> turned into a beautiful cylinder. And if you imagine this type of structure with a nanometer scale hollow in the middle, you can do a lot of things. In fact, we went on to do things like filling these nanostructures with some other materials like metals. You can make nanocomposites. So there are a lot of creative things you can do. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, people have been fascinated by things like uh, uh, flow of water through these kind of nano channels. You know, what, what happens to water as it flows? What kind of molecular structure water has? So th there's all kinds of beautiful stuff that you can think about if you have controllably built nanoscale cavities and that has implications in filtrations and other uh, applications. <laughs> but the point I was trying to make is that, you know, suddenly people figured out that you can have these amazing, perfectly crystalline tube at the na you know, with a nanometer dimension uh, that is made of pure carbon. And not only that, <laughs> Ijima, who was looking at these structures, also realized that the lattice can be oriented differently with respect to the axis of the tube. 
So if you, if you follow the hexagons around the tube, you can have different levels of chirality or orientation difference with respect to the axis. And some of the theoretical calculations that was done early on suggested that changing the chir chirality not only changes the structure, but also changes the electronic structure. You know, so it was found for the first time that the same carbon tube with different lattice twists can exist as metallic tubes, semiconducting tubes, and so on and so forth. So suddenly, because of this nanoscale dimensions and this perfect engineering of the lattice, people realized that you can have carbon that might be electronically interesting. It could be used in semiconductors, perhaps. You know, so maybe one day replace silicon. So again, this is kind of a major breakthrough in the sense that for the first time, people realized that nanoengineering has more to do with the actual change of functionality than just changing the structure itself. And that, that was a huge impact. And a lot of people later on went on to find all kinds of fascinating materials based on this idea that you can engineer materials at the nanoscale, engineer atoms at the nanoscale uh, with precision and get different types of materials and properties. From a synthesis point of view, nanomaterials have another problem. So, what, don't, I mean, it's a crowded slide, but what I'm trying to show here is, if I just simply make nanotubes, there are many, many ways of making uh, nanomaterials, and I don't want to go into that, but essentially if you make nanotubes and look at the distribution of particle sizes in these, whether it is a nanotube or a nanoparticle, you see a broad distribution. And it's very, very difficult to control you know, exactly the dimension or even the chirality that I mentioned to you about. Right? So this intrinsic variability that exists in nanomanufacturing poses as a major problem uh, in this technology. <coughs> you know, on the one hand, it's very hard to control the distribution. Maybe you can narrow the window, but still, it's very, very hard to make ex you know, exactly the same nanotube structure uh, in a larger volume. And on the other hand, there is a strong correlation between the nanotube structure and the electronic properties that I already mentioned. Right? So how do you kind of come to point with this whole dilemma that you know, on the one hand you have a very close correlation between structure and properties, on the other hand it's rather difficult to create uh, one specific structure or one specific size. And this is something that we still deal with as a major problem. What normally people do is to get very tight windows in this distribution and then maybe do some purification process to get a specific type of structure, which I'll show you later. But with even this issue, people had imagination going through the roof. You know, uh, Richard Smalley, who was the Nobel Prize winner, the discovery of fullerenes coming from rice, used to say things like, uh, you know, I, I would like to build a long fiber with nanotubes and uh, go fish fishing with it. I mean, essentially there were uh, claims that you could have a space elevator made of carbon nanotubes because of the strength of the carbon bonds that uh, individual nanotubes had. Uh, but that whole idea was not an easy thing to accomplish practically. And obviously, uh, you know, there are many reasons for that, but one of the fundamental reasons is that nanotubes are typically short fibers, right? I mean, the, the uh, synthesis process that we use essentially gives you hundreds of microns long, or maybe millimeters at the maximum, right? So how are you going to take these millimeter long tubes, although they are intrinsically perfect and very, very strong, to build a much larger macro scale fibers. You know, that is again a holy grail in this business. And it has taken a very long time to be able to continuously spin nanotube fibers into what you can see is actually a colleague of mine at Rice University who can spin now very you know, miles long nanotube fibers by wet spinning processes. But that doesn't really give you the kind of strength that you need to make a space elevator because essentially it's a, it's a patchwork of nanotubes along the way. You know, individual nanotubes are still very small, and they all stuck, stick together by van der Waals forces, which are weak forces to make a large fiber. There are some tricks to improve the properties, but end of the day, you still cannot get to the ultimate strength that a single nanotube has in a macroscopic fiber. So that's another major issue. These interface issues come significantly into this picture, and the question is, how do you really translate the amazing properties of these building blocks into macro-scale objects, like fibers or sheets or all kinds of material structures? 
And you know, if you look at the increase in properties of these kind of fibers over the years, it's probably about 20% per year for the last several years. It still doesn't really match to the best carbon fibers you can make by the extrusion processes. Right? So again, you can see the, uh, the dilemma or the uh, disconnect in trying to extract the properties of an individual nanotube to a very large fiber. You know, there, there is, the interfaces comes into the uh, picture. There are some other issues with uh, uh, the actual manufacturing processes and what requirement is for uh, some of the applications. So during the early stages of nanotubes, there was a lot of talk about replacing metallic wires like copper in electronic uh, platforms, like interconnects. Interconnects really drives uh, a lot of the technologies in the electronics area. And uh, copper and other metals have serious problem when you have to pass a lot of current because they have problems like electromigration and these metal wires would oxidize, they fall apart, there are all kinds of problems. And it was really found in the early uh, times that the nanotube uh, material, because it's made of all carbon, can carry a lot of current through this without degradation. So in that sense, it was really a very good material. And a single wall nanotube is almost a perfect structure, almost a quantum wire, which means that you could ideally get high conductivity if you can pack enough nanotubes into a certain area to compete with metals like copper. But unfortunately, after many, many years of trying, people were not really able to create a dense carbon fiber that would compete with the conductivity of copper. So again, another interesting idea that came to mind quickly because of the intrinsic properties of nanotubes which didn't really translate to actual application. But nevertheless, there's been still a lot of work going on today to make fibers that do not have such stringent requirement. You know, uh, even though the conductivity of these type of nanotube fiber is lower than copper, the specific conductivity is still lower because these are extremely lightweight material. So if you divide the conductivity, electrical conductivity by density, then carbon material would still win. So there are some fascinating applications where metals cannot be used, where these type of fibers could still come into play. And another area was that people figured out over, the, uh, over time that you can actually grow these nanotubes as carpets, you know, almost aligned structures, which are fascinating. And because, of the, because carbon, uh, this graffiti carbon being flexible in compression, you know, for example, if, I, if you can take a single layer of carbon and push it, it, it actually will easily flex. And uh, when, when you make a cylinder out of it, you can have these flexible fibers, which are very robust. And if you grow them in an aligned fashion, you can have these brush-like structures, which are very, very interesting. And there were many, many applications that was considered for these type of uh, structures that are uh, patterned, uh, aligned arrays of nanotubes. Uh, you know, this is an application that relates to thermal conductivity. You know, because carbon is quite conducting, you could have these uh, uh, kind of designs that would allow you to extract heat from the chip, which you know, uh, thermal management is a major issue in today's uh, uh, electronic uh, structures. Or you can think about having contacts between moving parts. You know, this is another big application, especially at higher temperatures and so on, the typical metallic contacts that people have oxidize and it really has a big problem. So carbon again comes out to be a, a very interesting uh, proposition. And again, you know, a lot of people try to understand the behavior of these moving contacts using carbon. Uh, and they were to some extent successful. Uh, noise level is lower, so there's a lot of advantages of these. Uh, and then uh, other interesting aspects related to uh, these aligned structures. Uh, you know, here, here is actually some of the things that we did um, almost a decade ago, uh, showing that uh, this aligned arrays of nanotubes can absorb a lot of light, making it one of the darkest material in the world. In fact, at that time, we even got into the Guinness Book of World Record uh, to produce the darkest material. And again, the actual physics uh, is fascinating on how uh, you can create uh, more and more dark material by absorption of light in the right way. <clears throat> the other possibility is to align in the direction uh, of the plane. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, the, the long-term uh, goal of nanotechnology would be to get uh, a structure that is a large structure that is made of one type of nanotubes that are all periodically organized. 
right? I mean, the, again, the, the difficulty in doing that is quite uh, uh, high, and the complexity of that problem uh, is slowly being solved. Uh, so today, uh, here is another work that is coming from a collaboration between us and another group at uh, RISE, showing that you can essentially uh, you know, separate nanotubes of certain type, metallic nanotubes, align them in one direction, and get a film that is comprised of one type of nanotubes that are all aligned in the same direction. So that kind of a structure becomes the uh, long-term goal of what we need to do in nanotechnology, and that will lead to a lot of applications. You can use it as a polarizer. You can use it for semiconducting uh, electronic devices, uh, all kinds of interesting things. But again, from a materials perspective, to get to that point, to this completely well-ordered architecture of a nano uh, element uh, on a large scale, uh, is really the big bottleneck in this area. I mean, most of the things that I mentioned uh, has to do with these two-dimensional alignment, because self-assembly uh, and uh, things like that can lead to 2D aligned material. But the real holy grail would be if you can create an architecture that is three-dimensional, organized by self-assembly. And this is really a holy grail. So one of the questions that people are asking is, if I have the right elements, can I build architectures like this, right, that are totally interconnected, highly periodic, uh, really in uh, you know, a large-scale, nanoscale, metamaterial. You know, what is the difficulty in doing this? Uh, so I think you know, many of the people have tried to figure out how you can actually create these interconnections and periodicities in these lattices. And uh, one of the things that we did was to create some, uh, uh, some changes in the processing that we do to make these materials, ultimately making a, a solid, 3D network nanotube architecture, although not periodic. You know, to get to periodicity, that's a different story, but you can, you can get large area, large scale uh, 3D uh, structures. And uh, also from graphene, I didn't mention too much about graphene, but graphene can also be interconnected because they are building blocks very similar to carbon nanotubes and build these three-dimensional architectures with the right porosity uh, and so on. Uh, and if you can do that, then you really can build materials that are fascinating in terms of membranes, in terms of uh, porous material, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And here is one example of an application. These porous structures of nanomaterial for carbon has been uh, able to achieve. Uh, they show uh, essentially extremely high range of thermoelasticity. So if I, if, I, if I can make these scaffolds of carbon nanomaterial, they are very, very elastic at extremely high temperatures and very, very elastic at extremely low temperature, all the way to cryogenic temperatures. So again, by utilizing the right kind of building blocks in the nanoscale and creating the right kind of architecture, you can make a lot of interesting structures that could be widely applicable. Then the question is how complex architectures can be made and how you could make these uh, materials. Uh, in the case of carbon, there's been a lot of theoretical predictions that suggest that if I can create the right curvature, uh, both positive and negative curvature, and create these kind of honeycombs, you can really change the behavior of carbon. There are even predictions that pure carbon can be made magnetic by having the right kind of curvature and geometries in these uh, uh, materials at the nanoscale. Uh, of course, it's extremely difficult, as you already uh, can, can imagine, to make these at that scale. Uh, you know, what we can do is to make it at a different scale. You know, many of these complex architectures, uh, we call them Schwarz sites because these minimally curved architectures have been predicted by German scientists for a long t uh, time. And those kind of materials can be 3D printed. And again, 3D printing comes into this picture in a very different way. 3D printing is really a bottom-up approach of building things. Right? It's very different from most of the uh, structures we make by joining and building down. 3D printing actually prints the whole structure. I mean, today people can print a whole house by 3D printing. Right? The thing that people cannot do is to print at the nanoscale, right? because the techniques and the inks that you can develop does not allow you to do this at the nanoscale. But if you could do nanoscale printing of some of these you know, materials like nanostructures, then you might be able to access some of those properties that I mentioned to you. You know, really, how do you build the next generation of carbons by creating this complexity, by printing and other kind of techniques? In fact, for specific scales, for specific material systems, you can print at the nanoscale. 
You know, this is actually using some kind of a two-photon polymerization technique, and you could create 3D printed architecture. This is made from glass uh, at very, very small scales. So I think combining all these different uh, know-how, what we are going towards is to be able to print many things at the nanoscale, and then the whole situation could be very different uh, in building these uh, structures. Now, chemistry, of course, is important. Uh, you know, I didn't mention too much about chemistry. I was just focusing on carbon alone. But carbon can easily be converted or modified by adding chemistry. You know, even a simple process as burning carbon is doing chemistry. Right? You oxidize carbon. Uh, but oxidation of carbon, it might seem pretty straightforward, but it's not, really. Because if you oxidize carbon, what you get is a structure like this. You know, you have this aromatic structure from the basic graphene layers, and then you start to add all these complex functionalities. And there's no way today you can oxidize carbon and get just one type of functionality. So that's a very complex problem in itself. <coughs> and then we have done, you know, a lot of people have actually been working on these oxidized carbon, oxidized graphene, uh, called the graphene oxide. And uh, there's uh, different ways of converting oxidized graphene to reduce uh, you know, graphene oxide and so on. And you can build devices uh, with this. So for example, we were creating a supercapacitor structure by taking uh, a layer of graphene, oxidizing it, and then locally reducing it to make more conducting regions, which are actually the electrodes of this device. And ultimately, you can use them for uh, interesting applications. Or you can think about uh, taking a graphene layer and actually breaking it down to quantum dots, or quantum disks. And quantum dots are really very uh, useful in many technologies. And uh, you know, most of the time, you hear about quantum dots from semiconductor materials like cadmium sulfide or cadmium selenide. But those materials are normally not very uh, friendly uh, for uh, you know, most of the applications. So we were actually looking at potential of getting carbon-based quantum dots that would be fascinating for uh, light emission, as well as some catalytic studies. So uh, there's a lot of work going on today suggesting that if you can modify or manipulate the carbon dots with specific dopants, you can use them as catalysts for CO2 reduction. So once again, there are different types of applications, but the goal is to really uh, um, control the architectures of carbon that you're making at the nanoscale. Now let me briefly talk a little bit about these other uh, structures that uh, we have been working on and uh, you know, move from carbon nanotubes to something that is two-dimensional. Again, graphene uh, came after the discovery of nanotubes uh, by uh, peeling off layers of graphite using a scotch tape and then exploring the properties of these. Uh, and again, there was a Nobel Prize awarded to the people who did that for exploring the physics in this 2D uh, material. Uh, now 2D materials are fascinating. Uh, they're challenging in different ways. And here is an example of a 2D material that has been grown on a substrate and transferred onto another substrate. And you can see that uh, the uh, structure already has a lot of extrinsic defects that appear as I just transferred to a different substrate. Uh, and, and you can imagine in you know, a material that is as thin as a single atom uh, you, and, and pretty large in lateral size, you're trying to pick it up and place it onto the substrate, that is, you know, for anybody that would be a tremendous problem. And, uh, you know, you see that. And, of course, because this structure and properties are so strongly correlated, you do see the effects of that in the materials that you deal with. And there are a large number of these 2D materials similar to graphene based on layered architectures. And uh, again, they go all the way from semiconductors to metallic to insulating to superconductors. There are all a variety of compositions that you can make in this 2D format. And ultimately, again, if you want to build uh, functional architectures, you need to put them together. You have all these interface issues. Uh, and the same similar kind of problems that I talked about in the carbon nanotubes comes here as well, uh, although the dimensionality is quite different. The question again is uh, how do you controllably make these materials? There are multiple ways of doing it. You know, th think about graphite as a layered structure, a uh, deck of cards, for example, and how do you really extract individual uh, cards or individual layers? One simple way is to really peel it off one by one. And you can do that physically by peeling layer by layer, or you can peel the whole thing using some kind of a solution exfoliation approach. And a lot of people have now beginning to look at uh, exfoliation as a method to make bulk uh, 2D materials. Uh, 
Uh, and many of these 2D materials have fascinating properties. You know, I'm just giving you one example. One of these structures that we created from a bulk material by exfoliating, uh, we found that there is an extreme uh, low coefficient of friction, uh, which means that these materials, if it is cleaved along certain crystallographic directions in the bulk material, show extreme smoothness or you know, almost atomically smooth, which means that uh, you know, they can be very, very slippery or can be very low coefficient of friction. Just uh, uh, you know, uh, one aspect of this 2D nature. You can also grow them now scalably over a very large area, you know, uh, or, or even roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing by vapor deposition processes. And again, uh, many, many works in literature that shows that you can make very large area 2D material. Another way to make this would be to take 3D material and convert them into 2D. You know, take a non-layered system, convert it into a layered system, and then remove layer by layer. So there are multiple ways that exist in today's literature that allows you to make these materials that are single unit thick, you know, coming all, almost to the, the end of the thickness you can get to. You know, you're almost looking at the frontier in terms of dimensions, in terms of thickness. <clears throat> But again, I think some of these problems that I mentioned about transition from the building block level to the actual application level uh, is uh, important to realize. You know, uh, many times the people who look at these materials from an industry perspective uh, have different requirements. You know, for example, if graphene were to be integrated into semiconductor industry today, it has to be CMOS compatible. The processing, the, the defect densities, the requirement, the charge carrier densities, uh, mobility, all, all, all those things, right? So there is a gap, certainly, that exists between lab and fab, lab to fab. I think you know, this is something that uh, slowly uh, the industry and the academic people are beginning to discuss. And uh, what will be interesting is to see how many of these techniques can be uh, integrated. Many of these approaches that we have in the lab can be scaled up and so on. And, you know, there are many, many predictions and demonstrations at the ac academic level in creating new types of devices that will beat silicon technology one day. You know, silicon, of course, has reached some kind of a, you know, a limit in terms of performance, in terms of dimensions. Uh, although they have reached uh, less than, you know, close to five nanometers in channel uh, dimensions, there are fundamental issues that uh, silicon technology faces, you know, electrostatic issues, the uh, minimum power that is required to turn on and off, you know, this thermodynamically limited. So one has to think about very different schemes, different architectures of devices, uh, for example, based on tunneling, you know, tunnel FETs and things like that people have proposed. And these 2D materials that we can create today uh, perfectly fits to those type of demands and requirements uh, of these new devices. The question of whether they can be you know, integrated into the system, into the platform that we have today, is a different question. That, that's, that depends on the processing and other uh, things that industry needs. But fundamentally speaking, people have proven, demonstrated, that these new types of devices can beat silicon in many ways and go to even smaller dimensions that silicon can work on. I mean, there are many things, if you were to integrate these materials into applications, uh, need to think about. You know, for example, defects in these materials. Uh, how can you characterize defects? How can you understand defects? And you know, obviously, defects are important. You know, we have seen this time and again in silicon technology, in gallium nitride technology. You know, the moment you solve the problem of defects, the material becomes viable, right? And in the case of 2D materials, uh, how do you characterize it and how do you document and so on is becoming uh, sometimes an issue. And this is actually a slide that shows that, you know, if you compare a defective materials to a defect-free or defect-less material, you can clearly see the electronic structure change dramatically. Uh, and that, again, becomes an important factor. In the 2D materials case, there is also another fascinating aspect. And this is a story that is being played out. Uh, and wh what that is, is the ability to stack. So I already mentioned that uh, you know, th these structures are like a deck of cards, right? You have uh, you know, layers that are stacked on, one, on top of each other. And between the layers, uh, the interaction is pretty weak. It's uh, controlled by Van der Waals interactions. And the question is really, can you take different types of layered materials and mix them together? You know, for example, can I take a graphene layer, can I take another layer from another composition and put them together and what these materials would look like? 
It's, it's a fascinating thing for material scientists. You know, people call it artificially stacked Van der Waals solids. So, you know, it's like taking decks of cards with different colors and then mixing them together. And, of course, each of these cards now goes to the atomic level thickness. And you can get some amazing materials that has never really existed before. And the fact now that you can take layer by layer or, or create layer by layer systems makes this all the more appealing and interesting from uh, the material science perspective. And there are even additional interesting factors that come into this picture. So imagine you're taking two layers that are atomically thin and stacking them together. What really determines the interaction between these two layers? You know, in the case of cards, it probably doesn't matter because there is no real interaction uh, uh, from, from uh, at atom to atom level, right? But here, you are essentially having lattices that are put next to each other, and there's always electronic interaction that happens, you know, depending on the distance between the layers, but also uh, depending on the rotation between the layers. Because imagine you take a layer, take another layer on top, and then rotate. And depending on the actual orientation relations between the atoms on the two layers, you start to get different types of interactions. So there is this whole field now emerging, suggesting that this rotational business can be utilized to make new materials. You now people talk about these uh, uh, graphene, two-layer graphene systems that can even show superconductivity at the right angle between the layers. So you can imagine the engineering happening at the nanoscale, but even beyond the nanoscale by simple things like twisting and so on. You know, we saw that already in carbon nanotubes, a small structure change or helicity, chirality that is introduced into the lattice changes the electronic properties dramatically. So what we are seeing is the strongly correlated effects when you go to the small scales, you know, between uh, structures or, you know, uh, small changes in the lattices creating significant changes in the electronic structure. So this, this whole Twisted layers, you know, more, uh, more, essentially more patterns are when you take two uh, layers uh, and twist them together and you get an interesting pattern uh, because of interference. And those are now becoming one of the aspects of this engineering at the nanoscale to create materials and devices that might look fascinating. And then there are other aspects also which you can think about. Uh, you know, for example, I already mentioned that there are multiple compositions that you can find that have similar at atom thick layers. So, you know, although you can think about stacking a layer on top of the other, you can also think about taking two layers and stitching them together, right? So in addition to the stacked structures, you can also have lateral heterostructures. You know, again, we are all talking about these kind of engineering at the nanoscale. Imagine how you can do this. That's a fascinating aspect of it. And this is one system where this type of structures is possible. You know, boron, nitrogen, carbon. You know, carbon we already saw, graphene, it's an atomically thin layered system. Boron nitride is another material which ex looks exactly like graphite, you know, exactly like graphene. One layer of boron nitride has the same structure as graphene, but because it's made of boron and nitrogen, they form a very strong ionic material which becomes electrically insulating. So you're talking about two different structures, graphene, a flat, atomically thin layer, boron nitride, flat, atomically thin layer, with totally different electronic structure. Graphene has a zero band gap, whereas boron nitride has a 5.6 EV band gap. It's almost a, a strong insulator. So what if you start to put these things together in the lateral dimension, stitch them together, you know, almost like a quilt, as you can see, right? So that makes another fascinating, and boron nitride has other applications. I just put it in the slide to show that uh, one can grow these nanotubes just like uh, boron nitride, just like graphene, and uh, use in applications like membranes and so on. Uh, in fact, we have actually a very large center at RISE called uh, NUT, which is nano-enabled water technologies. You know, filtration and membranes are very important for these, and nanomaterials are very useful in these cases. But here, here is actually a designed engineering architecture made of hexagonal boron nitride and graphene that I mentioned. You know, atomically thin, but they are actually joined at the edges. And they are these beautiful atomically sharp interfaces that you can build by engineering these two different materials together. And you can, once you can do that, you, know, you can peel it off and you have devices. You can essentially build an entire device on a single layer of material, atomically thin. So that, that's what nanoengineering is all about.
So you could create materials like this. You know, you have two different compositions, and th this is not boron nitride and carbon, this is a different composition, different materials, uh, for example, very similar. One is tungsten sulfide, other one is molybdenum sulfide. And both are, again, 2D materials, layered systems, but both have different properties because one is tungsten, one is molybdenum. They have different, similar structure so that you can actually stitch them together. So you can essentially make structures like this where you have an atomically sharp interface. On one side, you have tungsten sulfide. On the other side, you have molybdenum sulfide. And what is also fascinating about things at that dimension is things like atom mobility. You know, one fundamental question is, if I make an atomically thin material that is built from two different compositions, how stable is this interface? Right? If, if this type of structures are to be used in a device, stability is important. Right? So you can see very easily that some of these atoms here has actually moved over the interface. Right? So at the atomic scale, at the nano scale, Lots of things, beautiful things happen, you know, atom movements and stuff like that. And that has to be also understood if you are going to look at these as a potential device material. And this is, a, again, a very different type of structure. Again, it's made of what is called molybdenum telluride, very similar to those molybdenum sulfides that I showed you. But here, the difference is that molybdenum telluride has two different phases. So the same composition can exist as a metallic phase and a semiconducting phase. Slightly distorted structure, but lattice parameter is very similar. Everything is similar. So, and one of them, this 2H phase is semiconducting, and one T prime phase is metallic. And again, it's just based on small distortions in the lattice structure. And again, the question is, can I make these arrays of atomically thin layered materials that controllably has regions of one type and regions of the other? So we're really talking about engineering at the nanoscale, right? And again, this is moving closer and closer to this quantum kind of technologies where you can have control on individual atoms. And how do you really manipulate spins and defects, single defects and so on? So this whole, you know, for, for, from our perspective, material science perspective, we are really trying to get access to every atom that is there in a material and see what can be done. Right? and how you can manipulate, how you can control locally and, in, uh, you know, uh, and globally. And there are fascinating physics also. If I can make these uh, stitched together structures, these lateral junctions, then uh, there, you, know, you can think about all kinds of combinations and topological materials which have some superconducting behavior or very different types of physics ex existing in these. So again, engineering uh, at the nanoscale is the b basic concept to build these kind of architectures. <laughs> and not only that, you can also make uh, uh, multi-component two-dimensional materials. You know, we mostly talked about, we, we started talking about graphene, then we talked about two-component, boron and nitrogen, then, or you know, things like molybdenum and sulfur. But you can have multiple you know, elements that are in this 2D material. And I'll show you just one image that shows uh, a, a material. This is, again, an atomically thin unit, a single unit thick material that has molybdenum, tungsten, sulfur, selenium, that is really uniformly distributed throughout the structure. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really a beautiful image. Because it's taken by one of the state-of-the-art electron microscopy where you can pinpoint the position of position and chemical uh, composition of every atom in the structure. And uh, what it tells you is that you could actually make an alloy of these uh, four component system uh, as a single atom thick uh, material. <clears throat> and intercalation is another option. I'll skip that. And maybe just uh, two, two or three more slides, and then I should finish. Uh, the, the other third example that I wanted to give is nanocomposite or composite materials. Now, most of the things that exist in nature are composites. You already saw a beautiful example of a composite, the, the shell. Right? I mean, many of the things, because nature has limited access to elements, or our body has limited access to elements, you can only get it through the food chain, they really try to play around with whatever is available to make these complex hierarchies and complex uh, uh, comp composite architectures. So composites has got a huge uh, uh, you know, play in the industry. You know, I, I think that in the very short period of time, uh, the carbon fiber composite will replace many of the other existing uh, metal, metallic alloys. It's already replaced the aerospace industry dramatically, and the automobile industry is probably the next to come if the cost goes down <clears throat> in the next uh, years. 
And you know, this is an interesting example of a nanotube uh, um, um, ceramic composite, which is used uh, for, uh, uh, in batteries, electrodes. So again, one of the big uses for graphene or nanotubes is in the batteries, because for, by adding a small amount of these, you can get very high conductivity. Many of these electrode materials that people use are not conducting, so they need to add carbon to make it conducting. So how do you do that? Either you can put just normal carbon, which means you'll have to put 25% of carbon, or you can put 3% of carbon nanotube. You'll still get the conductivity that you need. So there is some advantages of these nanoscale uh, high aspect ratio material. So this is a, an interesting composite. It doesn't have to be ordered, but nevertheless, uh, it's very, very useful. Uh, but if you really want to go to the next level of complexity and engineering, you have to think about engineering the interface. Uh, and uh, interfacial engineering in a composite is quite complicated. And uh, you know, of course, it can also compromise the properties of the intrinsic nanostructure that you're putting in. Uh, so in terms of application, I wanted to throw this in. Uh, this is probably something that came out of graphene application. Uh, it's actually coming from Manchester. Uh, they have a, a shoe that is made from uh, graphene uh, and a particular latex matrix. And uh, obviously, it has higher performance and so on. Uh, maybe cost is also not so uh, small. But uh, nevertheless, you know, composite material uh, is where you add two materials together to get uh, better performance. And we have done quite a lot of work on these kind of composite structures. And you can see that uh, there are some advantages of uh, understanding and engineering the interface. On the one hand, you can create a strong interface, which will make a strong material. On the other hand, you can make a weak interface, which will give you more damping and other properties. Vibrational damping is a, is a major issue uh, in high performance uh, uh, automobiles and so on. So you can play around with this interfacial engineering to get better material. Uh, and you know structures like graphene has some very fascinating properties, including fatigue and so on. So these materials certainly could be good players in this uh, composite business. And this is really uh, uh, you know the, the the real goal what I was trying to talk about in the composite area. So here we made this composite with some polymer and nanotube, and what we found is that as you dynamically load this structure, it actually increases in strength. So that you don't really it doesn't happen very uh, often that you have a material <coughs> that actually changes properties dynamically, but in the increasing order, right? Normally, we think about materials that with loading will decrease its properties and it'll fail ultimately. But here is a structure that actually changes its behavior and increasing stiffness and strength as you load. And the reason for that is because the interface is dynamically reconfiguring as you're loading. So you know, how do you play with these type of materials? And in the end, what you're trying to build from a materials aspect is, how, how do I make materials like self-stiffening materials, self-cleaning? You know? There are a lot of concepts in nature that allows you to let the materials go, but it will do the function by itself uh, you know, with time. So how do, can I make a material that self-strengthens? Because there is already an example, right? Bone, bone is a good example. With loading, the bone continues to increase in uh, strength. Of course, it replenishes. It's more biological in nature. But can you make synthetic materials that actually can undergo this type of behavior, which is fascinating. And again, composite design is a major aspect in this. And you know, we, we have been, many people have been looking at uh, how we can use nanomaterials in composites. And the advantage of using nanomaterials in composite is that the interface volume can be very high, right? Because you know, at the end of the day, the Surface area is what determines the interfacial area, uh, and nanostructures have very high surface area, so essentially have huge amount of interface. So if you're manipulating or playing around with the interface, you can have a huge impact uh, compared to microscale objects. So <clears throat> the summary of my talk is, you know, we in the academic world are playing around with many of these nanomaterials. Most of this it is trial and error, uh, but I think in some cases, the right designs, uh, maybe guided by computational efforts and so on, can lead to some spectacular structures. Uh, some of them I showed you already. But many times, it's understanding you know, certain things, like interfaces. You know, how do you really, uh, how does the behavior, ma macro scale behavior, overall behavior of a material uh, changes with the interface that you have? How do you engineer that? Right? So that's, again, uh, the thing, and uh, in the long run, I think our future depends on 
material science and nanotechnology in the sense that how do you really make it more responsive? How do you make these materials and structures more uh, active, dynamically reconfigurable, you know, self-cleaning, self-stiffening? So a lot of these long-term perspective in materials uh, has to do with uh, uh, integrated structures, you know, maybe power within your uh, structural uh, attributes, or maybe sensors, large number of sensors, responsiveness to the material. And I think having nanostructures and nanomaterials in these gives you added advantage because you have a lot more interfaces to play with, a lot more sensitive materials that are embedded, and so on and so forth. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I mean, my group is quite uh, international, and uh, uh, you know there are people with different expertise coming together and working together to solve some problems. Of course, we also have uh, various aspects of materials that we look at. Uh, it's not just what, we, what I talked today, but also we have uh, 3D printing lab, energy storage lab, uh, and coatings, and many other applications we look at as well. But uh, the basic platform that we work on is nano engineering of materials, and that is what we are probably good at. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, I hope I, at least I conveyed some of the aspects of nano materials technologies, uh, which are probably food for thought more than anything else. Thank you.